So these four people are the four most powerful individuals in Vietnam. Now, behind them, okay, we've got a population of 86. There's only, well, there's less of the 86 million, there's only four, roughly four million members of the Communist Party. They elect members to represent them at the party congress. The congress happens once every five years. It's kind of like going to the Republican National Convention or you went to the Democratic one, I guess. Okay? So they, they establish their policies, procedures, do their little things, and they're gone. They're out of there for five years. The uh, National Assembly down here, there are 493 members. That would be kind of like probably our Congress. You know, we've got, what, 535. The National Assembly, they're elected. They serve a five-year term. They meet briefly every year for maybe a week or two. So all they're doing is ratifying what basically the four people at the top, in fact, have already decided to do. Now, you might say, please. Um, the four people that you had, there were no connecting lines between the four. Oh, I'm, well, no, no, they are, they are all, uh, like the old Soviet Union, the, the people who really run, and I guess it's probably closest to our cabinet, they call it the Politburo. Mm. Those four are the senior most members. So the Politburo, among themselves, decide who is going to be the uh, Secretary General, who is going to become the Prime Minister. So no, no, they 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 talk to each other. Okay, so they are in fact the day to day. Politburo. Pardon? Above them would be the Politburo. Well, they are part of the Politburo, and they are typically elected, appointed <coughs> by the, the well, the, the, the party officially endorses what the Politburo says. Here's what we would like you to do. Because again, the Congress meets for about two weeks once every five years. There's no opposition party. There is no, no. I'm glad you raised the question. Now, there is, an, there is a pro democracy movement, which I'll talk about. It's called Vietnam. But there is only one legal party in Vietnam it is the Communist Party. If you hand out literature advocating, if you're lucky, the first time you might just be warned, the second time you will lose your job, and the third time you will go to prison for seven years. If you do a Google for pro-democracy movement Vietnam, you'll find the names of the journalists and the lawyers who are, have been imprisoned for basically uh, defying the government uh, edict, but uh, again, well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, there's only one official party. Anything else is outlawed. Uh, some economic comparisons. Uh, this is the Ho Chi Minh Stock Exchange. There's a smaller stock exchange up in uh, Hanoi. But just for comparison, there's only 247 publicly traded companies on the Ho Chi Minh Stock Exchange. On our NASDAQ, there's 2,800. Then there's another 3,200 on the New York Stock Exchange. So, as you can see, Vietnam is just barely beginning to privatize their companies, which is part of the problem in terms of wealth or market value of those uh, companies in billions. 29 billion for these 247 by market value, what the shares are worth. By, ver by comparison, U.S. 4 trillion, and that's not even counting the New York Stock Exchange, that's just NASDAQ. So you can see that Vietnam is infinitesimally small compared to the U.S. economics-wise, and yet population-wise, it's about 28 percent. Of course, they've just started, too, in, in privatizing. Here's a growth. In the U.S., we're lucky to do uh, 2 percent. Uh, Vietnam has been number three behind uh, China and India for about the last uh, six years. Uh, the slowdown here was due to the uh, economic recession. This year, they're supposed to grow uh, at a 7.2%, which is, again, about four times the growth rate of the U.S. So a lot of people, financially, will, will be inclined to say that Vietnam is an emerging market. Some would call it a frontier market. But it's growing so rapidly 
that at some point it'll never catch up with China, but it certainly could catch up with smaller countries like Thailand or Korea. So a lot of analysts who specialize in globalization and foreign markets are saying Vietnam might be a good investment for the future. Uh, this shows uh, comparative valuations. The P-E ratio is the price of the stock versus the earnings per share. And as you can see, compared to some of the other markets, Shanghai, of course, is always high. Vietnam is selling for about half the price of uh, Shanghai. So shares in Vietnam are cheap. Now, why are the shares in Vietnam cheap? Well, number one, they've got a, they're even farther behind China in terms of human uh, rights. But also, China, or China, don't forget, started back when, what, 72, Kissinger was in China. Uh, Vietnam didn't open up until the late 80s, and it wasn't until the uh, 90s that we even had uh, diplomatic relations. So Vietnam is starting at a much late, later stage. These are some of the companies that are uh, headquartered that have op major operations in Vietnam. You'll notice that uh, we've got three oil companies up there, and that's because Vietnam is known to have offshore uh, uh, minerals and uh, petroleum. And so those companies are all actively involved in, uh, in exploring for oil. Uh, there's a little Kentucky Fried up there. Next time you buy a pair of Nike shoes, uh, take a look at the label. It's quite possible that it uh, was made in, uh, in the Vietnam. Uh, there's Intel, I've already mentioned, uh, now has constructed its largest manufacturing facility in the world, uh, just north of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, First Solar, everybody knows that company, right? Headquartered down in Tempe. So they're presently building a large uh, facility also to build uh, the uh, solar electric panels. Naturally, you got Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and KFC. As you can see here, of uh, the, uh, the various individual companies, uh, Vietnam's largest export partner is now the United States. Uh, you might think, oh, it's going to be Japan or China. No, they're relatively small. All the rest of the other companies, mostly European countries, uh, would aggregate the other 50%. But again, the largest customer of Vietnamese products is uh, the largest you know, of Vietnamese products is the U.S. Uh, next time you get some frozen shrimp, take a look. They're probably from uh, Vietnam. Your textiles, maybe from Vietnam. Certainly your tennis shoes and in the future, part of your computers. Uh, for those of you that want to invest in Vietnam, there is one New York Stock Exchange listed electri electronic traded fund. It's uh, this one up here. So you can any day of the week go online and, and buy shares in that particular. Uh, the London Stock Exchange has about a dozen Vietnamese listed companies. And you can also buy some of the Southeast Asia-oriented funds that may have part of their funds in Vietnam as well as in Thailand, Singapore, and South Korea. Now, the Vietnamese Constitution guarantees freedom of speech. <laughs> now, that's a true statement. But Article 79 of their criminal code, as you can read, now that's pretty open-ended. Activities aimed at subverting the people's administration. How do you define that? You pretty well define it the way the authorities want to define it. Uh, the harshest penalty is death. Most of the lawyers and journalists who have gone to jail under the provisions of that, uh, seven years seems to be the, uh, the average sentence. Now, one of the things that just came out of the, uh, the Congress that back in January, February, the uh, Prime Minister then in February, you know, two months ago, publishes a, uh, a new decree that says journalists who publish articles, quote, not, interest in the, not in the interest of the people. Now, what is that? So obviously, freedom of speech does not exist in the... Uh, Vietnam, and you have to tread carefully, as I found out, when you write things. Uh, all the state, all media, te all the television stations, radios, publishers, every everything is controlled by the government. There's no such thing as a private 
privately owned publishing company. Official censorship is practiced and they admit it. All pro-democracy groups are banned. Um, online, you'll find the ones. I had a little experience with the internet being monitored. Uh, I did a book signing thing for the American Chamber of Commerce in Ho Chi Minh City the summer before last. And they wanted a little squib, you know, they could put on their, you know, their membership thing and so forth. So at the conclusion of it, I kind of did something like what you've got here, and I said, among the things I will talk about, the hoops and hurdles of getting published in Vietnam. The next day, I had a phone call from my agent in South Vietnam, and he said he had just received a phone call from the publisher up in Hanoi. And the question was, what is going on down there? So they picked up on a little, one little sentence that would, appeared on the internet website of the American Chamber of Commerce, picked up on that, and started questioning it. Facebook and, Swoop and uh, Twitter are uh, blocked, and as a result of all of this, caution kind of rule. I'll tell you another story about caution. The, uh, the day that I did the book signing was the evening at the Carvel Hotel. And uh, the general manager of the hotel had arranged for a press conference. It was supposed to be held just before the, uh, the meeting. And that morning at breakfast, the name of John Gardner, John said, I've got some bad news for you. He said, uh, we can't have your press conference here. And he said, furthermore, we can't sell your book here. <clears throat> Even though the book featured the Caravelle Hotel, some of the scenes were there. Our joint venture partner, the hotel was a joint venture between a French investor and Saigon Tourist, which is a government-owned tourist company. The representative, I call her the dragon lady, of the joint venture partner, that morning had decided that there would be no press conference. She didn't want any mention in the newspapers or anything about the fact that my book was going to be there, sold at the Caravelle Hotel. I said, John, what is it? He thinks. He said, he said, two days ago, some prominent journalists were arrested here in Saigon for pro-democracy activities. As a result, we, meaning the hotel management, wants to be very careful about not doing anything that would get the dragon lady in trouble. So that's the, uh, that's kind of the atmosphere that goes on in uh, Vietnam. I should tell you that there is a, a pro-democracy uh, reform movement. It's headquartered in California. It's called Viet Cong. Many of them are expats, people who used to, you know, left uh, Vietnam. Uh, there are some who are Vietnamese members, but they have to tread very carefully. They have had small demonstrations, especially during the last thing when the Middle East started blowing up. There were small groups of these Vietnam Tan organizers that would show up on the streets in Hanoi and say, you know, we want reform. And of course the police will chase them off. And I'm sure they got their warning. But you just, you, you have to be very careful with you know, what you do and what you say. A, 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 a few little personal things on censorship. This happens to be the cover of the U.S. version of the book. Uh, the flag there is the actual, it's, it's a photograph I took of an actual V.C. flag that was given to me in 1966, I guess it was, down in the Mekong the Delta. I've always kept it. So I thought, well, what would be interesting for this book, since I was going to call it Saigon Gold, I would uh, take a photograph of this and have my cover designer use that. Uh, this, of course, is the U.S. Uh, Distinguished Flying Cross. So when I took this book with me to Vietnam to meet with my agent, this was in January of 08, he said, well, the first thing we're going to have to do is change the cover. <laughs> he said, this is very sensitive. <laughs> you can't do that. Okay? So this is what came out of it. You know, this is also a photograph I took of <laughs> some trees along the, the Saigon River, and my cover designer did this, and... The historical forward down here, you can't read it, by John Gardner, general manager of Caravelle Hotel, Ho Chi Minh City. I thought, oh, this is great. I'm going to get marketing for this. We're going to have this book on sale at the Caravelle Hotel because A, I'm, uh, the book already contains some scenes of things that happened in the book at, at the Caravelle Hotel. And I thought, well, I'll get the general manager to write the historical forward about the history of the Caravelle Hotel. Great thing. It was built in 1959. It's again where all the prominent uh, uh, 
newspaper reporters and magazine writers. That's where they hung out. It was air conditioned, had a nice bar up on the 10th floor. What else could you possibly want in life? That little logo down there, by the way, has to be on the front of every book. That's basically saying that, oh, this book is licensed for publication in Vietnam. Now, you can go on the Saigon streets and you, buy, you can buy knockoff copies of uh, this book, which I strongly recommend. Uh, A Bright Shining Light. Some of you have probably read it by the Pulitzer Prize winner. Okay. You can buy softback knockoff copies of that. But it's illegal. As soon as the police see these guys wandering around selling this stuff, they'll immediately uh, chase them off. So that's for sale primarily to U.S. tourists. These are some of the things that uh, first the government up in uh, Hanoi and then my publisher in uh, Ho Chi Minh City said, we think this is what you should do. 